Welcome to the Fit 15 Podcast Show, where you'll find health and fitness inspiration, motivation, and information shared in 15-minute episodes. Tune in while getting a move on to make leading and enjoying the benefits of a healthy lifestyle almost too easy. It's the Fit 15. And now your host, Katherine Basu. Welcome to the Fit 15 Podcast Show. I'm your host, Katherine Basu. And today on the Fit 15, I have the honor of being joined by one of my favorite scientists, Dr. Amy Ryan. Dr. Ryan has been on the show before. She was actually my second guest on the Fit 15 back in February. We talked about making sense of scientific research. So I will link that episode in the show notes, but it is episode number four. And it's one you definitely want to listen to, especially if you've ever had the experience that I think most of us have had of hearing about some item that we love and enjoy being the best thing for us one day based on a study that the news is talking about and then seemingly the next day it is not good for us and causing cancer and just the worst thing ever. So if you have had that experience and you want some help making sense of scientific research and you don't have a scientific background, definitely go and check out that episode. Or even if you do have a scientific background, I know I had a background in science. My college major was biology and I definitely learned some things by talking to Dr. Ryan during that episode. So head on over, check that out. It should make you feel a little bit better, make sense of things. Today on the podcast, I've brought Dr. Amy Ryan back to talk about science, nutrition, and our relatives and ancestors. I wanted to bring Amy on to talk about this because she has a great background for it, which I'll read her bio again for those of you who are new to Amy or forgot just in a minute, but also because I find that many diets are often, or some popular diets out there are said to be good for us because they are the way our ancestors ate, but it may or may not be possible for us to go back to eating the way our ancestors ate. And another thing that you want to consider if you're trying to follow some of these diets that were created to help us eat the way our ancestors ate is that it's really hard to describe a typical diet of any species, including humans. So Summer is coming. It's a popular time of year for people to seek out diets that are going to help them get summer ready, but I highly encourage you with some of those popular diets that, like I said, are supposedly based on what our ancestors ate and really any diet to think a little bit before you leap and try that out. And that's what Dr. Amy Ryan is going to help us with today based on her background, which I'll tell you about before we head into our conversation. So Dr. Amy Ryan is a scientist who studies primate behavior and cognition. She is currently an autism research fellow at the University of California, Davis, studying how we can potentially learn more about causes of and treatments for autism by studying monkeys. She has studied monkeys in a variety of settings from human managed ones, such as laboratories and zoos, to wild populations in the forests of Uganda in Africa. She has a passion for engaging the public about the animals we share our planet with and for increasing opportunities for others to participate in science. Dr. Ryan, welcome back to the podcast. I'm so excited to have you back and chatting with us today. Oh, thank you for having me. Love being here. (laughs) So today we wanted to chat about science, nutrition, and our relatives and ancestors and kind of figure out what our ancestors ate and then maybe, you know, how do we figure out what is a a good, a good diet. So wondering to get it started, since you, you get to hang out with and study primates, what is something surprising you could tell us about what our primate relatives eat? Oh, well, that's a good question. So, I mean, the first answer would be that it's not exclusively bananas, which is a (laughs) stereotype for uh, monkeys and Uh, So for our primates and just to uh, jog people's memories of uh, monkeys, I mean, we have monkeys that live in the trees and we have monkeys that if you think of like baboons, they live on the ground. 
the monkeys I study are macaques, which right now actually live in cities. Those are like, they're, they're the ones that if you go to Asia, like you usually get harassed by a monkey, that'll be a macaque. Who, Got it. Yeah. Um, but then you also have apes, which uh, are chimpanzees, gorillas, uh, bonobos, and orangutans. So those are the apes. Uh, so they're bigger. Um, they don't have a tail. They tend to uh, be the ones that are a little more uh, akin to humans in terms of their cognitive uh, intellect abilities. <laughs> um, so certainly something that might surprise people is that uh, all of our primate uh, relatives tend to eat a plant-based diet. So mm -hmm. that's something where, especially if what you've seen is King Kong and uh, the scary gorillas, but uh, what most primates, uh, so the majority of primates are eating uh, everything from plants. So they mm -hmm. aren't uh, carnivores like cats uh, or dogs and bears and things like that. Uh, so what a typical monkey or ape would eat is they're eating leaves, they're eating fruit, they're eating bark. So they'll eat the bark of a tree, um, okay. they'll eat the stems, leaf buds, flowers. Um, but uh, they'll eat the occasional insect and things like that. So that's uh, always up for grabs, if you will. Sure. Uh, so certainly they'll uh, eat insects and things like that. Uh, so what a typical uh, monkey or ape is doing is they're very opportunistic. So mm -hmm. they're spending their day foraging and looking for fruiting trees. So this is something that is highly dependent on geography and season. So depending on where you are, your diet's going to look very different. Um, and the, the idea of why they forage all day is that uh, leaves and fruit and bark and all that, it can be kind of plentiful, but they do have to eat a lot of it. Um, kind of if we were eating salads for every meal, you would have to eat more salad than a big hamburger or something like that. Right. Um, yeah, and also the whole group needs to eat. So our relatives like us tend to be social creatures. And so the whole family's going out. So the whole family's got to eat. And so you might come across a tree that has fruit on it and there's only a couple of fruits. And so not everyone gets one. So yeah, <laughs> but I think it's very cool that if you think of gorillas, which are the largest primate. Hey guys, it's Catherine. I hate interrupting Dr. Amy Ryan, but wanted to let you know that if you are out for an out and back walk and only have 15 minutes, that was your halfway point reminder. You want to turn around now. We are going to run a little bit beyond 15 minutes. We're going to run to around 30 minutes, if not a little longer, but it's a good conversation. So definitely finish listening to it when you have time. All right, back to Amy. In the world, they, I mean, there are these, the silverback gorillas, which are the adult males are huge muscular creatures and they get all of their protein from plant sources. Mm. And so I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, I was at a conference for nutrition and behavior change, and you know they were telling us that it's really important. The bottom line is to just, you know, there's all these different diets out there, and they all say different things, but most of them, and we were talking about an exception earlier, but most of them will, t you know, have in common, especially when there's research done and they're, and they're ranking the diets in terms of um, just their, their overall health, is that they're going to have a high volume of, of fruits and vegetables, and people do often think you can't get any protein from from plant sources but but that the the monkey could be a good example or a horse as well right yes a absolutely. strong animal <laughs> that he's mostly plants so yeah yeah so uh, they I will note that um, their digestive systems could be a little different so like mm -hmm. with horses um, their ruminants and so they sure. literally their digestive system is a lot more specifically uh, designed in the evolutionary sense to get the most nutrients and protein out of plant sources. Uh, Got it. But certainly, and so gorillas are similar. They have a very large colon for what we typically see in an ape body. Mm -hmm. But so there's still certainly, I mean, there is protein in leaves. I've analyzed the nutrient components of leaves. Um, <laughs> kind of all about the protein fiber ratio. So are you, how much fiber do you have to eat to access the protein? Got it. So different. Oh yeah. I never, I never thought about that before. So are, do you know off the top of your head or maybe, maybe we'll have to check this out later, but are there certain 
you know, plants that we as humans eat that would have a good protein fiber ratio that would be would be good for us to check into or? Uh, that's a good question. Um, certainly, so from my research, the younger leaves, so this is just, I mean, in the perspective of monkeys eating leaves off trees, mm -hmm. younger leaves tend to have a higher protein to fiber ratio. Mm. Or I think that's good as opposed to a lower, but the yeah. younger leaves have more protein compared to fiber, whereas older leaves, so a leaf that has been hanging out on a tree, that's going to have more fiber and less protein. And primates, uh, for the most part, are living in places where there's no autumn. <laughs> so they're living <laughs> in tropical places where the leaves hang out for a while. So Right. Um, but uh, I'm not sure specifically about what we eat uh, mm. because the, so the primates I studied were in Africa. So they're eating very different species <laughs> from us. But uh, if I could make an educated guess, it would be younger, which perhaps means fresher mm -hmm. <laughs> leaves. Whereas right. If you get something that's a little older, but uh, that's a good question. I could check for what we eat uh, in terms of what has a good protein to fiber ratio. Yeah, I'm thinking actually too, like I wonder, you know, the difference between like baby spinach and regular spinach, but I think that's probably why sprouting has become maybe a thing where you're eating. Oh, interesting. I, I, again, I need to check that. I didn't think about it before, but I'm wondering if that's one example of, you know, having the sprouted vegetable versus you know the full thing in that it might be because of the protein but again we'll have to, yeah, check, on good that. Question. <laughs> we'll have to check on that one but see all these interesting things that come up <laughs> yeah yeah so if our if primates are mostly herbivores most of them why are we omnivores if they are our relatives that's a good question so most I've been saying most, so most primates eat plants. The vast, I mean, that is pretty much the uh, primate diet. There's, like I said, they occasionally eat insects, but we don't consider that uh, eating meat, if you will, I guess, because mm -hmm. they're just kind of crunchy snacks <laughs> with protein. Uh, but actually, uh, chimpanzees, which are uh, our closest relative, along with the bonobo, but chimpanzees actually engage in hunting. So they will, as a group, so they live in groups, they will hunt down other vertebrates, including okay. monkeys. Uh, so they're, <laughs> they will hunt down smaller animals. So they eat meat. Um, and so that's something, it's certainly, they're not eating it in the same regularity as we do. So it's not probably something they eat every day, but uh, they do display the behavior. So they're uh, sharing meat amongst each other. Certainly this isn't cooked meat or anything like that. Mm. Um, and there is some discussion in anthropology about whether uh, the uh, evolved behavior of eating meat somehow contributed to our evolution because uh, if so, chimpanzees are our relatives, but we have about 14 million years between us where mm -hmm. our last uh, common ancestor uh, was. So our last common ancestor lived 14 million years ago. And since then, we have evolved a much larger brain size than the other uh, relatives of primate. And people kind of go through and try to understand why that could be. And meat eating might be part of that answer, but there's some debate about that. But um, it's certainly something to keep in mind. So while we, having a plant-based diet is certainly the strongest thing that we have in our background, um, incorporating meat is also a part of our evolutionary history. Uh, certainly, because there seems to be evidence that uh, our past human ancestors uh, or other species, uh, the hominids, if you will, which if you hear that term, that's, uh, so they're not any more chimpanzee relatives, they're just our relatives. Uh, they also hunted for meat. Got it. Okay, so kind of came down the line. <laughs> Very cool. So we're talking about, you know, how our, our relatives ate, and one of the common diets that people try to go back to is the, the paleo diet. So what could you share with us about that, and why might that whole concept be a little problematic besides the fact that it's a diet? And personally, I'm not really big into diets, but <laughs> we could talk about that more. But yeah, paleo yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it has some good points. I mean, they, the paleo diet steers people away from processed food, which sure. um, I think everyone could uh, take some advice from that. 
Um, I looked into a little bit of the origins of the paleo diet, and it started uh, with an article in the New England Journal of Medicine, which um, is a highly regarded journal, so it's a mm-hmm. high visibility journal. And in 1985, which was the year I was born, and it's been a while, so. Just, um, <laughs> Same here. Crazy. It seems like yesterday, but it's not yeah. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will argue, though, um, so I'll bring that up in a bit, but. Um, these uh, scientists argued that the human genome, which just as a note for 1985, the genome wasn't sequenced yet. So this is all theoretical. We didn't sequence the human genome until the early 2000s. So Mm. this is all um, kind of theoretical. But they argued that the human genome uh, hasn't had enough time to adjust to foods that we uh, produced through farming. So things like grains, dairy, beans, that mm-hmm. our genome, so the DNA that car- we carry with us and has changed through the course of evolution. But uh, their argument is that farming developed like 10,000 years ago, which for evolution is pretty recent. And so we haven't caught up with, uh, we haven't caught up with these new foods. And Uh, They used available info on what hunter-gatherers eat. So that's uh, opportunistic eating, like before farming, when people would hunt animals, gather plants to eat. Um, And there are still some hunter-gatherers around today, so they are an important uh, source of information of how we can uh, eat and behave and be humans without farming. Mm-hmm. And they used it. They used information on hunter gatherers to generate what most likely was the Paleolithic humans' diet. Mm-hmm. And so the idea being, like, we can generate how much protein and um, you know fruits and vegetables and things like that. And uh, that's fine and well and good. But uh, then the you know, a professor kind of hooked on to this and then designed this diet under the idea that, um, because certainly also what this paper was arguing was that the 1985 paper was that they were making kind of a causation argument, which is that we now have all these diseases, um, thinking like diabetes and cancer and these or, you know, heart disease Mm. that we have now that we don't think Paleolithic humans had. Oh, and look at their diet. And so they're kind of making this connection between the diet and we should eat the same diet if we want to avoid these, you know, modern human problems of, you know, diabetes and cancer and kind of these things that uh, show up uh, in our population. Mm -hmm. But um, that's a little bit... Uh, I would say that there's some arguments to be made that that's not an accurate connection. Um, I mean, one being that we uh, used to die a lot sooner. I was going to say, a life expectancy was not. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, if you're, uh, if you're dying because of very immediate things like getting attacked by an animal or, um, does that that's the first one that comes to mind I don't like what else paleolithic people died from starvation maybe I don't know like all sorts of things uh because they didn't have the health that we have definitely oh yeah like definitely pathogens and things like that probably not the same level of medical care (laughs) oh definitely yeah so definitely you can kind of scratch that but definitely Definitely, uh, people died a lot sooner from very immediate things like predation, but they were also Mm -hmm. getting infections and viruses and bacteria that killed them because they didn't have the medical care that we have today. And so we are living longer than them. And as humans live longer, these other kinds of diseases, like the accumulation of uh, plaque in your arteries and, you know, kind of your insulin uh, relating to diabetes or cancer, which has something to do with like the cell growth in your body, you'll start to see these more, but you didn't, it's not a, it's not an equal situation that you didn't see them because they ate the paleo diet. It's that they had other things going on. Right. Um, and so that's something where, um, the paleo diet kind of, the idea behind it is they prohibit food that was not available to our stone age ancestors. 
Um, but something that I think of when I think about this, <clears throat> excuse me, is that to suggest that the, so maybe our genome itself hasn't changed in 10,000 years, but uh, what we understand in biology is that things change even if it's not directly your DNA. So sure. first of all, um, the environment has changed. So the food we eat is very different than what people ate in the Paleolithic times. Um, first of all, the meat we eat is very different because we've domesticated the animals. And so right. um, it's definitely a different uh, food experience to eat a wild animal that's been running around. Um, you hear the term gamey for mm -hmm. animals that um, people eat that weren't just domesticated food. So our animals, the meat that we eat is different and even the plants. So plants are also domesticated. So if you think about our fruits and vegetables, we have designed those and they're actually, they can be, it is a form of GMO to have genetically modify a plant to uh, be bigger and more juicy. So it's not all evil in the sense of Genetic right. I always think of that when I think about GMOs. I'm like, we've been doing this forever. Maybe not yeah. the same speed, but. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's domestication. So, I mean, the fruits that we eat are different than what our relatives in Africa are eating because they're just coming across wild fruits. And those fruits tend to be a lot less sugary and plump and mm. um, vegetables. We have are bigger. So. The food we're eating is different, both the plants and animals that we eat. Um, and in terms of ourselves, too, we're different in that uh, there's actually a lot of interesting work out there you can check about what they call the microbiome, mm. which is uh, the population of bacteria that lives in our body, which is ginormous. We have more bacterial cells in our body than our own cells. So think about that. Yeah. <laughs> what yeah. are we really? Uh, <laughs> but a lot of, uh, in our gut especially, bacteria is becoming a very important component to our ability to have certain diets or process nutrition um, and to our overall health. So you think of people uh, that ingest probiotics, the idea with that is that you're working on the composition of the bacteria that are in your population. So you're adding mm -hmm. what they call good bacteria into your population. Um, and so that's something where our gut bacteria is going to be very different than what it was 10,000 years ago, because we've kind of, our bacteria are kind of the product of the lives we've been living. Sure. Um, so we are more in tune with the environment. I mean, that's just my first guess of how uh, we are different, uh, babe compared to 10,000 years ago, but uh, there's some new exciting research emerging too about uh, epigenetics, that's EPI uh, mm. genetics, which shows that um, our, we can modify things about our genes uh, that we didn't think was possible before. And that's really, uh, like if you think of how twins are different, they have sure. the exact same genome, but there's things about the environment that influence what genes are expressed. And so uh, I think that we are a product of our environment. We're not the same creatures we were 10,000 years ago. Um, right. And another point would be uh, what I brought up with our primate relatives, which is that uh, food is opportunistic when you don't have a grocery store <laughs> or a farm. And so uh, even if you just look at human history, I mean, if you were looking outside of the farming and grocery realm, what people have available to them in Africa is going to be different than what people have available to them in South America or North America mm. or Europe. So uh, the plants and food, the plants and animal composition is going to be different. Or you think of the Inuit people um, in the North where mm -hmm. they eat very little plants and vegetables, uh, but yet they have their diet shaped to where they live. Right. And so when people say, oh, we're going to model our diet off of the uh, people in the Stone Age, I mean, which <laughs> which people. Right. Um, so there is no one diet that a species has because the uh, diet is highly dependent on where you live and what season. So, I mean, you're going to find different fruits and vegetables available depending on the fruiting cycle or if you live somewhere 
it's cold, I mean, it could be that they're all available at one time of year and not the others. So um, I think it's uh, spurious to assume that you can just kind of model what is the official diet of a species or a time or a people. Yeah, no, I, th- I definitely agree with you there. And I think it's good to consider, you know, any, any time we're looking at any of these diets, right, what, where did it come from? And it, does it really, is it really based on anything scientific, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, well, you have me think of a few other things too. I guess, you know, the, the gut bacteria, 10,000 years is a lot longer time for them than for, than for us, right? So in terms oh, yeah. of their adaptations and everything. There is know. a lot of really cool research coming out about the microbiome, especially now we have the technology where we can kind of handle looking, because uh, you look at their DNA to kind of identify them. Mm-hmm. And we now have the technology to really understand that amount of information. Because like I said, there is just so many of them. So their DNA just like overwhelms. And so uh, we now have the technology to kind of handle looking at the composition because our stomachs are like a own little world where there's different uh, colonies of different species of bacteria. So people are trying to balance them. And uh, I'm in the neuroscience field and a really interesting uh, direction of research is that the gut can influence your brain. In terms of how even so there's a lot of cool work about how things that go on in the gut can affect your behavior or affect your mood and emotions and things like that which I feel like isn't even that surprising when you say that because right or like of course when I'm hungry I'm hangry Um, (laughs) um, so yeah I think there's a lot of cool directions with that and also like the effects of probiotics on things um, or like on your self. So that's what you're trying to do with probiotics is like kind of alter that microbiome in ways that um, people suggest there's certain beneficial bacteria and you want to like up the population of your beneficial bacteria uh, in your gut and things like that. Now I know I'm, I'm taking us down like another path here, but have you seen yourself, I mean, for the research on the like consuming probiotics or just consuming I feel like there's, I haven't found an agreement as to whether like, you know, you're consuming the the bacteria and they're staying alive and like, you know, repopulating in the gut versus you're eating certain um, foods that will support your current microbiome. I mean, do you have any, any thoughts on that or were the researchers showing us anything there or is there still more that has to be? Yeah. Um, so yeah, like with yogurt and things like that, um, I will say just looking at the research, something that I'm still not quite sure why, but something that is a thing is that if you want to, so you ingest these probiotics to, uh, bring these good bacteria into your gut and you want them to colonize, you want them to like survive and thrive Mm. because it's a competition in your gut and so there's other bacteria there that want to stay there (laughs) and these other guys show up and they got to find their place in the world of your gut (laughs) and so um you can't just like take one pill and that's it like you have to continuously like take probiotics and I'm not sure why, because I feel like once the one, if you can demonstrate that they've colonized your gut, which people can do through uh, poop samples, uh, <laughs> to me it would seem like they it has a footing and it can grow without ex, without continuously providing probiotics. But right. for some reason, that's not how it works. Um, and I would say, just my impression is I'm pretty. So I'm not sure how it works in pill form as like you have to watch for some bacteria. I'm more convinced of ones that have to be uh, temperature sensitive, like in refrigerators and things like that. When, if it's just something sitting on a shelf, I'm not sure whether the bacteria in there are uh, right. still alive. <laughs> right. Right. Um, but that's a, yeah, that's a interesting line of research. I've looked into it a little bit, but yeah, the delivery is something that's pretty important. And I mean, you could waste a lot of money if you mess up the delivery and just keep taking something where the bacteria are dead, you're not going to have an effect. Right, right. So another another one of those times where it's good to look at some of these studies to see. Oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, Amy, it's been great having you back on the show. Uh, 
really appreciate you being a guest. Wanted to ask you how people could connect with you if they, you know, wanted to continue any of the conversation or just kind of check out the research that you're working on. Oh, absolutely. So I'm on Twitter um, at uh, Amy underscore M underscore Ryan. Uh, so I would say I keep that uh, most up to date. So um, I tweet about science things. So um, kind of what I was discussing in terms of the nature of science sometimes. So Twitter is a really good a place that scientists discuss with each other the nature of science. We discuss mm. science with other people. So I tweet about that. I'm also a human, so I'll also tweet other uh, things that interest me or <laughs> things that I have a reaction to um, because I'm definitely interested also in increasing opportunities for people to uh, participate in STEM uh, so that's something where uh, people are also trying to understand different ways to engage the public in science and engineering and mathematics and things like that. So um, I will certainly uh, put uh, my information on there about uh, my publications. I also have a website you can link to on there. Awesome. Um, Twitter is going to be the freshest info and you're welcome to follow me, message me or anything involving Twitter. I love that. See, I've been really in a fight with Facebook lately and I have my Twitter account, but I don't really go over. So now you're encouraging me to, there could be hope for <laughs> something different. Uh, yeah. I mean, well, for me, uh, I mean, science, there's a whole science Twitter. I mean, literally uh, there was a discussion about Amazon <laughs> reviews because we all buy random things for our science. And so somebody actually made a review about a tea, a tea strainer and how it was really great for their ant studies. <laughs> so they're like the ants don't get out and they can still communicate through olfaction and you know this is great for my experiment and so there's funny things like that too with this um I found it was a really good um networking opportunity I like meeting other scientists there because sometimes you get pretty narrow in your field right and so this way I can actually engage with people that are a little outside of my field, learn from them, discuss things with them, because we are all in a very similar scientific uh, general field, but sometimes you get a little narrow-minded uh, into your kind of realm of exactly what you study. So I like being able to talk with other scientists, but also follow other people. I follow like my uh, Senate and congressmen and mm. uh, try to stay active on who I follow, some celebrities too, because like I said, I'm human. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that's, I mean, got to keep it, have a little fun in there too. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Or not, not that science isn't fun, of course, but you know, just not always thinking at that higher level, maybe. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Awesome, Amy. Well, thank you again for joining us. And, you know, maybe we'll have to have you back one day. I don't know. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to The Fit 15. For show notes and more, visit fitarmadello.com slash podcast. See you next time. Hey, guys, it's Catherine. I'm sure you can tell by the fact that today's episode was a little more than double what it normally is on The Fit 15, or I try to strive to have it be, that I love talking to Dr. Amy Ryan. So if you have any questions, any follow-up questions, and would love to have her back, give me an excuse. I would love to have her back and to chat with her more and definitely go follow her on Twitter. I have her links in the show notes. Our topic today was all about whether or not we can eat like our ancestors and if we should try. And one main thing Amy was talking about in terms of the Paleolithic diet is that it could be good to follow because we're not eating a bunch of processed foods, but it's pretty hard to follow the Paleolithic diet in terms of exactly what our ancestors ate, in terms of what the food looks like, and to design a diet around what Paleolithic people ate. So you can breathe a little easier. You don't have to buy that Paleolithic diet bar when you check out from the grocery store. I don't know. I was in the grocery store the other day, and there was this chocolate bar, and I wanted to make an impulse buy, and I asked for some reason... I asked the guy at the counter whether or not it was a good chocolate bar. I didn't notice that it was approved by all of the diets. And he made a face and said he had tried that one. And it was just not good unless you had to follow those specific guidelines. So if you want to have your chocolate and enjoy it too, you're looking for a way to get healthy and tone up for the summer, but 
want to do things in more of a practical way, don't want to follow some crazy fat, I highly encourage you to check out my upcoming fitness program, the Drop Two Sizes Fitness Challenge, which starts up in a little less than a week. We start on Monday, April 16th, 2018. And I do guarantee results if you have and want to lose two sizes in a 10-week period, but it's also a really great program for jumpstarting your healthy lifestyle. So we're not doing a fad diet. You'll be able to get results and feel better from the inside out, even if you're not trying to lose any weight. You can find all the info over at fitarmadillo.com slash D2S or just by going to the Fit Armadillo homepage. I do have a link in the upper left corner. So take a look. I would love to cheer you on this spring and help you head into the summer feeling confident without having to start eating like a caveman or woman. Hope you enjoyed my conversation with Amy. Don't forget to leave a rating and review for the podcast on iTunes and send me your ideas. Why should I have Amy back? Give me an excuse. I would love to have her back. Thank you again for listening and I will chat with you tomorrow if you subscribe to the podcast. Bye.